Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are, um, as probably most of you are aware, we're um, looking at the final chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18. Um, I just apologise, I'm suffering from a rather um, unpleasant cold this evening, so uh, might be a little bit uh, slow going, but we'll, we'll see how we get, get along. Yes, chapter 18. Um, Thanks, Keita. I uh, I take it that the sound is okay. Um, what we've been hearing in previous weeks really is the way, and, and last week in particular, is the way Krishna is recapitulating the three central ideas that pervade the whole of the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, there are other subjects discussed at different times, but the principal ideas are Oh, thank you, Gita. Uh, our karma yoga, uh, desireless action formed just because it is duty, because it's right thing to do, but without any selfish motivation. He's, Krishna has recapitulated that idea. And then last time we saw a transition being made, a clear transition, I think, from karma yoga to the way of knowledge, jnana, the, the three big subjects that Krishna really focuses on above all else are karma yoga, jnana, realized knowledge of spiritual truth, and then bhakti, devotion to the supreme deity, who of course is Krishna himself. So last time we heard uh, how uh, Krishna described again karma yoga, performing action without selfish motivation. And he said that the achieve what this achieves is Naishkarmya Siddhim Paramam, the highest state of Naishkarmya Siddhi. And Naishkarmya means freedom from karma, breaking free from the cycle of action and reaction. The reason being that karma as is explained in, in, in much more detail in yoga philosophy, karma isn't generated by the physical action that you perform, but by the state of consciousness that motivates that action. And that state of consciousness leaves a mark on the mind called a sanskara in, in yoga philosophy. And it's that sanskara that stays with the performer of action that eventually produces a, a future karma. Now, if one acts without motivation, desirelessly, then there is no uh, sanskara left. And therefore, the uh, karma yoga brings with it, as Krishna said, nice karma siddhim, the success of transcending karma, which of course is moksha liberation but it's not it doesn't end there because krishna in i think it must be verse 50 he then said uh siddhim prapto yata brahma tata noti nibodame a person who has siddhim prapta attained that siddhi of being nice karmia free from karma now here he says how such a an individual such a a, a, a successful as aspirant on the spiritual path, how he then reaches Brahman, hmm. which is the highest extent of knowledge. So uh, karma yoga brings you nice karma siddhi, it allows you to break free from karma. And from that position then, one can expand into the way of knowledge which ultimately, at its highest point, its furthest extent, enables one to reach Brahman. And as we say, we, we uh, Brahman means that state of being which is truly spiritual, beyond our current state of being. It's the, the higher domain of the spirit. Um, and then in three verses that we looked at, at the end last time, Krishna laid out exactly how one goes uh, from karma yoga to the uh, the highest extent of knowledge which reaches Brahman. He gave three verses, 51, 52 and 53, which all run together, which really focus on 
with renunciation of worldliness, renunciation of materialism and dhyana yoga paro, dedicating oneself to dhyana yoga, the yoga of meditation. And that meditation, that uh, renunciation of materialism and worldliness at the end of verse 53, which is what we, where we concluded last week, he said, Brahma Bhujaya Kalpate. Then one achieves Brahma Bhujaya, the existence that is Brahma. Now, it's not specific exactly what that means but i think what we can take it as it means it is uh, the domain of the spirit beyond this world transcending this world up into the the domain of the spiritual uh, spiritual reality brahman brahma buyaya kalpade and you might think well that's it then that's the end that's the final conclusion no because it goes on, the progression continues. Uh, and in verse 54, which we're starting from today, Krishna then starts to talk about that person, that individual who has achieved Brahma Bhuya. Such a person is known as Brahma Bhutaha, one who is existing spiritually, existing uh, as Brahman. So Brahma Bhutaha, what is such a person actually like? First thing he gives, Brahma Bhutaha Prasanatma. Yeah, Atma at the end of the, uh, the jewel there means um, probably not the Atman, the spiritual Atman, but it means the whole being of that person. Uh, it could mean the mind, but I think it means your whole being and identity. And what about it? Prasanna, at peace, tranquil still, transcendent, serene. In our lives, we're constantly being pulled this way and that, up and down, here and there. But the Brahma Buddha individual, Prasanatma, completely transcended the dualities of our normal day-to-day -day life. Not that they don't come, but as Krishna said at the end of chapter two, they're like rivers flowing into the vast ocean, just as all the rivers flow in the vast ocean, but the vast ocean remains unchanged and undisturbed by them. So in the same way, desires, uh, mental states flow into the Brahma Bhuta, but he remains Prasanatma, or she remains Prasanatma, completely tranquil and unmove them. So, Brahma Buddha, Prasanatma. And what does that tranquility amount to? Nashochati, Nakankshati. Nashochati, not grieving, not lamenting. And Nakankshati, not hankering, not desiring. Because there are always things that we don't have, things that perhaps we did have and we've lost, which would normally cause us to grieve and lament. I haven't been able to acquire this. I haven't been able to get all the things that my uh, desires focused upon and therefore shokchiti, one grieves over that, but the Brahma Bhutta, her person, no shokchiti, never grieves, not bothered about such matters, not concerned with them. Nakankshiti, because there's no hankering vision is that sees one's things as they are, that all these things are really rather petty, trivial. All the acquisitions, wealth, power, prosperity, reputation, admiration, the things that we've all aspired for, perhaps, uh, speaking as an elderly person, throughout one's life. Those are the things that dominated one, constantly, constantly striving and hankering at them, but Brahma Buddha ha prasanatma na shokshiti, na kankshiti, never lamenting for what one doesn't have, never hankering after those things either. Again, then, the next point about such a person, samaha sarveshu bhuteshu. I think that's right. Samaha sarveshu bhuteshu. Samaha, the easiest word in Sanskrit to remember because it means the same. Samaha is the same as same, you might say. Um, yes, so samaha, such a person is equal, the same. Um, samaha sarveshu bhuteshu. 
Yes, that's right. Equal to all beings. Now, uh, our normal day to day life is there are some people who we speak highly of, who we admire. This is a person I like. This person, though, has done me some wrong, said some words that I didn't appreciate, maybe criticized or even insulted. And therefore, I have that duality of those that I admire, love, make, and then the ones I uh, cleave towards. And then those persons who I, um, who I reject, I deny, I dislike, maybe even hate them, things like that. But the person who is on that Brahma Bhutaha, who is Brahma Bhutaha, Samaha Sarveshu Bhuteshu, equal to all beings. How is that? It's already been explained back in chapter three. The vision of such a person is Guna Guneshu Vartanta. He doesn't see a person, an evil, wicked, nasty, horrible person who I dislike, saying terrible things about me that, I, that have wounded me, because he sees only the Gunas interacting with each other. There is not. Uh, an evil person, but simply the action of Raja and Tamas, Rajas and Tamas acting on that person, and therefore no enmity is formed. It's that detached position, the position of the observer of the world rather than the participant in the world. Of course, such a person is a participant because they're performing karma yoga. Krishna has been insistent on that. You, be, not being a participant doesn't mean that you're separating yourself off. It means that emotionally you become detached from the world and therefore one doesn't have enemies uh, 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 at all. There is no enemy. There is just the way that matter unfolds, affecting different people in different ways. And from that serene, detached position, one observes the world. Some are hasarveshu bhuteshu. Some are elevated, some less so, but regard all of them the same. Of course, this is, it might seem an impossibly difficult position to attain. And with all these points that the Gita makes, they are absolute ideals to be striven for. You may think, well, that's impossible. And, and Certainly speaking personally, it seems like that. It is impossible. But I think the point is, it's an ultimate goal that one can move a little bit towards rather than attaining it. So the description has been given of the person, uh, Brahma Bhujaya Kalapate, such a person, Brahma Bhutaha, Prasanatma, utterly tranquil, Nashokshiti, not lamenting. Nakankshiti, uh, not hankering after things. Samaha sarve shubhuteshu, equal minded towards all beings. And then, Madbhaktim Labhate Param, such a person, the Brahma Bhuta, Madbhaktim Labhate, he attains, Labhate means to gain or attain, to reach Madbhakti, devotion to me, Param that which is supreme, the supreme state of devotion. Now, this is very interesting because it's become perhaps a little fashionable uh, in, well, over the last hundred years, perhaps, to say that, yes, uh, bhakti, devotion, that's a, a step on the path towards knowledge, higher knowledge. Uh, knowledge is the highest path, etc., and bhakti is a lower stage, perhaps for those who aren't capable of reaching the elevated levels of knowledge. It's, it's sort of that hierarchy has been, um, uh, been indicated by a number of different uh, writers, etc. But the Gita doesn't say that at all. The Gita, if anything, says the opposite. Because the Brahma Bhuta, which is Nishtagayanasya Para, the highest state of knowledge, such a person then, Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param, then attains the highest state of Bhakti. So if there is a hierarchy, which I don't think there is, uh, it is from knowledge to Bhakti. The topmost stage is Bhakti. But what I think is apparent from taking the Gita as a whole is. Even though I've said three topics, karma yoga, jnana, bhakti, 
essentially they are just three aspects of the same broad path and we'll see that in the next verse then uh, as we go forward now jnana and bhakti aren't two separate paths they are almost the two features of the same thing you can't have bhakti without jnana and you can't have jnana without bhakti and karma yoga feeds in to both of them so essentially i would go as far as to say the gita teaches one path which is manifest sometimes as karma yoga sometimes as jnana the search for knowledge sometimes as bhakti devotion to the supreme deity to the lord in this case to krishna so my bhaktim labate param and now krishna's moving us ahead into the third of his major topics that he has been covering throughout the gita and this uh, discussion uh, runs right up to verse 66 which verse 66 is really the last verse of um uh, substantial instruction in the Gita. After that, it's concluding words, you might say. So it's focused mainly now for these next, what will it be, 10 or 12 verses, is on bhakti. Of course, Ar uh, and Arjun is again directly addressed about his position, but the focus throughout now for the remaining 12 verses of instruction is bhakti, so that the three topics are covered completely. Karma Yoga, now Gyan, now Bhakti. So, verse 55, Bhakja Maam Abhijanati Yavan Yas Chas Mitapvataha. Through Bhakti, Maam Abhijanati, one gains knowledge of me. So you see, again, in the previous verse, he was saying that the knowledge which brings Brahma Bhuta leads one to achieve Bhakti. Now Krishna is saying, Bhakti one achieves knowledge of himself. So the, again, you can see the close interrelationship and interaction between Gyan and Bhakti. Uh, Bhakti Bhakti Maam Abhijanati, Yavan Yas to ask me how I am, what I'm like, uh, and, and, and what I am, tapvataha, in full, completely. So bhakti brings with it complete knowledge of, of, of the divine nature. Bhakti maam abhijananti, yavanyas chasmi tapvataha. Tato, and the result of gaining that knowledge of the deity, tataha from this as a result of this thereupon tato maam tat having understood me tat properly completely uh, in truth the highest realized knowledge and i think the reason why krishna uses the word tat meaning true knowledge the highest knowledge i think he wants to distinguish this knowledge from the knowledge one can gain through through books. One can, yes, certainly read Gita and learn about Krishna, learn about the deity from it. But the real knowledge uh, that, that Krishna's talking about here comes through, as he'll say in a few verses, revelation from within. And we may remember casting our minds back perhaps to chapter 10, where Krishna again talked about persons engaged in bhakti dadami buddhi yogam tam i give them that buddhi yoga i give them the knowledge and then in verse 11 he said i who dwell within each person destroy the ignorance with the blazing lamp of knowledge so that's the relationship between uh, bhakti and jnana that the knowledge that comes the knowledge of krishna the knowledge of the deity that comes um uh, that, that comes as a result of bhakti is because bhakti induces the compassion the love of krishna and he therefore reveals from his position within the heart of every being he bestows the gift of knowledge upon you. So the knowledge that is tattvataha, the knowing of Krishna, that is full, complete, uh, etc. Um, that is 
comes from bhakti because it comes from within by internal revelation and it cannot be achieved from any external source you can listen to a hundred gurus teaching of it and they can give an indication of that knowledge but ultimately the full knowledge tattvataha comes from within hmm. tato mam tattvato gyapa vishite tad anantaram vishite vish means the verb to enter he enters or such a person enters um tad anantaram anantara means within enters within tat hmm. what is it what is it entering within it, almost certainly it means enters within Krishna, enters within Brahman perhaps, but gains entry into the domain of the spirit, ex exiting the world of matter, Vishute Tadanantaram. It's another way of expressing the idea of moksha. So, Bhaktamam Abhijanati, through Bhakti, one understands me, yavanyashchas mitapataha, how I am, what I am, who I am, uh, fully in truth. And having known, having come to know and gain that knowledge in full, tapataha, truthfully, properly, vishate tadanantaram, one enters within that spiritual domain. In other words, this is moksha, this is the transition from this to entering into that, that, tat, being the domain of the spirit. We are getting right to the heart of the moksha dharma idea uh, of the Gita. Now then, Krishna is going to say more about this way of bhakti um, in verse 56. And it's interesting the way he speaks here of bhakti, because when we think of bhakti, perhaps we think of um, offerings made in the temple, uh, bhajans sung, mantras chanted, prayers offered. And, and the Gita does refer to those uh, those parts of the uh, bhakti mark, the path of bhakti in verse um, 14 of chapter 9. He said, satatam kirte yantomam, always singing my glories. In uh, verse 26 of chapter 9, he said, patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhakti prayachchiti, making offerings of leaf, flower, fruit, water, etc. But here, when Krishna's again uh, speaking about bhakti, what is the offering? What is the process of bhakti? Sarva karmanya pisada kurvanu madhya pashraya. Sarva karmanya pisada kurvanu madhya pashraya. Performing all his activities hmm, dependent upon me, dedicated to me focused upon me, sarva karmanya pisada kurvano madhya pashraya. That's right, kurvano, performing all his activities, madhya pashraya, as a form of dedication to me. So it's the point is, I suppose, that Krishna's making here is that bhakti isn't something you do uh, before going to work at between 10 to 9 and and nine o'clock you make the little offering or it's not just on the Sunday afternoon when the bhajans are being sung. It's really uh, the focus of your whole life. One lives one's whole life in consciousness of the divine presence within. And one tries as far as possible to make one's whole life a process of dedication, living in uh, consciousness of the divine presence so that one thinks every action is this pleasing is this pleasing or is this offensive to the deity and again of course it's an ideal that krishna is talking about it, it it's you can't suddenly walk out tomorrow morning and start doing this if you haven't been doing it already it's a gradual process increasingly i think it's being urged be conscious of the way you live. Be conscious and try to make as much as your life as possible dedicated uh, to Krishna. And that's what bhakti means, dedicating your actions, not acting out of self-interest, but acting out of devotion. Of course, I'm 
several times read those verses from the Shuv Puran, which means acts of assistance to other living beings, acts of kindness, helping others. In the Shiv Puran, this is called Shiva Punya. It's Punya, but it's Shiva Punya because you do righteous, virtuous, pure activities as a dedication to Shiva or to Krishna, Krishna Shiva, as far as I can detect, uh, to one and the same. Um, uh, so, Sarva Karmanya Pisada Kurvano Matya Pashrayaha, and then Mat Prasadat Avapnoti Shashvatam Padam Avyayam. Avapnoti, one reaches Avapnoti. Ap means to attain. What does such a person attain? Uh, Shashvatam Padam Avyayam, the eternal position. Shashvata means eternal. Pada means position, status, condition of existence, if you like. Shashvatam padam avyayam, unfading, unchanging, free from the constant fluctuations that characterize existence in this world. That shashvatam padam avyayam. How is that possible that one attains it? Mat prasadat. Prasad here doesn't mean serenity, it means grace my blessing and that takes us back to those verses that i was mentioning um before in chapter 10 chapter 10 verse 11 tishame vanu kampartam ahama jnana jam tamaha nashayami tisham for such persons who are who follow the way of bhakti anu kampartam because of the compassion i feel for them the longing to help such persons. It is chapter 10, verse 11. Teshami Vanu Kam Ahama Jnana Jam Tamaha Nashayami. Nashayami, it's first person singular verse. I do it. What do I do? I destroy, Krishna says, a Jnana Jam Tamaha, the darkness that is born of ignorance. So therefore, again, that point about bhakti is being reiterated. Matprasadad, due to my grace, my blessing, the mercy I show to them, avapnoti shashvatam padam avyayam. It's a, a, it's a um, such an important concept of the Gita that not only do you yourself achieve enlightenment you transform yourself into an enlightened being by following the path of knowledge but also the deity krishna intervenes in that spiritual path and out of feelings of love and compassion the grace comes mat prasadad I do it for you. And we'll hear much more of that in a few verses time. That idea, uh, it, Ramanu Jacharya, because great Vaishnav commentator, calls it Bharasamarpana, the transference of the burden. Achieving moksha is the burden that we're striving for. And it seems so difficult at times, but Bharasamarpana means that that burden is lifted from the shoulders of the spiritual aspirant and taken up by the deity. And for us, it's an enormous and difficult burden to carry, but for the deity, it's very easy. So, mat prasadad avapnoti, shashvatam padamavyayam. And I make this point as well, this is why the Gita is such an important text. It stands if you like, at the, the crucial juncture of all Indian religion, looking back to the wisdom of the Upanishads, which are primarily based on Gyan, knowledge, and looking forward, both historically and, uh, and doctrinally, to the flourishing of devotional religion that we see in India over the past 2,000 years, in particular, Bhakti, and the Gita stands right at the heart of that, looking in both directions. And that's why the Gita, I would say, is a fundamental, not the fundamental, but a fundamental text for understanding the whole of Indian religion. So, Mat Prasadad, by my grace, by my blessing, Avapnoti Shashvatam Padamavyayam. The Bhakta attains 
that eternal changeless state the spiritual position and again now again now krishna turns directly to arjuna the previous verses have been general about the general process of devotion now he looks at arjuna because the gita is not exclusively for arjuna as again we'll hear later on it is for everyone but specifically at this point for arjuna mm. Chaitasa sarva karmani moi sanyasya maparaha. Chaitasa. Chaitas means the mind. Chaitasa. I think I'm memories going again. Chaitasa sarva karmani. Within your mind, all activities. Sarva means all. Karma means all. That. So, Chaitasa sarva karmani moi sanyasya. Sanyasya, it's that word renouncing, renouncing all your activities where mayi, unto me. And, and what that means again, it's that idea that instead of having your activities being performed for your own benefit, what will I gain from this activity? How much can I acquire as a result activity? Mayi sanyas, renouncing that self-centered consciousness may and instead transferring that consciousness that motivation for action to krishna chaitasa sarva karmani mai sanyasi matparaha one who is being dedicated to me making me the focal point of your life mm. chaitasa and it's interesting it's not about the physical actions that you perform they may be no different from anybody else it's the focus within the mind again this point the Gita has made over and over again it's not the physical action that's got to be changed it's the state of consciousness stop doing things for yourself make your actions all into offerings acts of devotion mai sanyasya matparaha mm. Buddhi yogam upasritya machchitaha satatam bhava. Bhava, B. This is imperative. That's why it's addressed to Arjun. You do it. Mm. What is that? Chaitasa sarva karmani mai sanyasya matpara. Buddhi yogam upasritya machchitaha satatam bhava. That last phrase, machchitaha, is easier to uh, to explain. Machchitaha, probably those who've studied Yoga Sutras will know, chitta means the mind again. Machchitaha means also thought processes. Machchitaha means with your thoughts, your mind fixed upon me. So again, it's that same point. When acting, the consciousness is not how much will I gain from this, but is this pleasing to the deity? Is this activity a suitable offering of bhakti, a suitable devotion? So, much mm, chittaha satatambhava, constantly, satata means constantly, always thinking in that consciousness, be like that, Arjunaha. But before that, Krishna has used that phrase again, buddhi yogam upasritya. Now, I've mentioned karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. Well, what about buddhi yoga? We had it um, back in chapter two as well, buddhi yoga. I think buddhi yoga, uh, as far as I can perceive, buddhi yoga and karma yoga are one and the same. They're two aspects of the karma yoga because karma means the action, Buddhi means the consciousness. So karma yoga consists of both the action performed and the buddhi, the state of mind that motivates the action. So buddhi yoga and karma yoga are two aspects of that same process of desireless action. So therefore, Krishna is urging Arjuna again, buddhi yogam upasritya, dedicate undertaking that buddhi yoga that state of freedom from selfish desire much chittaha with your mind fixed on me satatambhava be constantly like that yeah he's showing again i think in that phrase the relationship we noticed a, perhaps some weeks back now um between karma yoga and bhakti as well mm.
Machitaha Satatam Bhava. And again, you can see how Krishna's building up this uh, discussion of, of bhakti, first of all, in a general sense, now specifically to Arjuna. But of course, all the instruction given to Arjuna is specific for Arjuna, but it's also general, as we'll see in maybe a week or two's time. When Krishna concludes the Gita, he makes it very clear that this isn't just uh, for Arjuna, it's for every person, every human being. It's Sanatan Dharma, it's universal Dharma. Machitaha Satatambhava, keep your thoughts constantly fixed on me. Machitaha Sarva Durgani Matprasadat Tarisyasi. Machitaha, again, he's using the same phrase. This is verse 57, 58. I'm sort of lost track. Better check some people might try to, to, to follow. Um, yes, it's 58. Yes, 58. Machitaha Sarva Durgani Mat Prasadat Tarishyasi. Tarishyasi is future tense, it means you will cross beyond. What will you cross beyond? Sarva Durgani. Durga, of course, we're familiar, it's the name of the goddess, but it also means, well, the goddess is the, uh, the divinity of the manifest world. So Durga also can mean obstacles, that which is difficult to overcome, difficulties, problems. So match chittaha with your mind fixed upon me, Sarva Durgani Tarishyasi, you will cross beyond all the difficulties that you now face. How is that? Mat prasadat, again, by my grace. You may think, and we all think that, we have, life is problematic. We face old age, disease, death. Even if in the most successful life, we still face those durgas, if you like, those, those problems. But Krishna says, mat prasadat, Therese, you see, that art ending, grammatically it's ablative, it means as a result of, due to, because of, because of what? Because of mat prasad, because of the grace that I will bestow upon you. It's Barasamarpana again. Krishna is now taking Arjuna's burden from off his shoulders. He's saying, just fix your mind on me, much chittaha, and then Sarva Durgani Tarishyasi, you will cross over all the difficulties that you face, uh, Mat Prasadad, by the grace that I will bestow upon you. He's already said, Bhakto Sime Sakacheti, you are my friend, you are my devotee. And he says, because um, you are Priyaman, you are the one. Uh, for whom I have love and affection. Uh, therefore, mat prasada tarishyasi, you will cross beyond all the difficulties, the problems that are confronting you as a result of my grace. My grace, mat prasada tarishyasi, mat chittaha sarva durgani, mat prasada tarishyasi. Hmm. Is it next then? It is. Atachetvam ahankaram, Nashro shasi vinanksasi atachet. On the other hand, if, however, uh, atachet from you ahankaran, same ending, art on, because of ahankara, because of egotism, pride, self centeredness, if, however, because of ahankara, because of uh, egotism, uh, Ahankara, Nashro Shazi, you will not listen. Vinankshati, uh, you will suffer. You will have to continue to undergo the problems that you are facing. The solution uh, of, of fixing your mind on me, casting the burden upon me, is the only route out of the predicament if you do not listen. And I think the point is, all of us. I'm sure we've experienced, we don't like to be told what to do, do we? We, uh, we all have ahankara, we think we know best. And if someone tries to say, oh, you shouldn't be doing that, um, we bridle, 
um, we we become who, what right have you got to tell me what to do? Of course, Krishna Arjuna's seen the Vishvarup, so he may not feel quite like that. I think that's quite a persuasive uh, argument showing the Vishvarup uh, that Arjun should follow Krishna's instruction. And I think that's more perhaps, although it's directed specifically at Arjun, it's also for ourselves. When good instruction comes, be grateful for it. Don't think, oh, well, I'm a learned person. I know what's what. Humility accepting good instruction not necessarily blindly but accepting the value of it and following so krishna said, i think that's right isn't it much chitta hasarva durgani mat prasada tarishisi atachetvam ahankaran nashro shazi you don't listen to what i've said vinanxasi vinanxasi means really we will meet with difficulties destruction perish it's quite a uh, a, a serious word to use you will be plunged into suffering really is what it means this path that i've offered you because we know back in chapter one arjun had an enormous burden dilemma to deal with krishna has shown him the path out of that dilemma but if arjuna is too proud to accept good instruction then he'll be plunged again into that really problematic situation, vinanxati. Mm. Let's just do one more. And this is interesting as well. We'll start it though. Yadahankara masritya nayochi iti manyasi. Yadahankara masritya. If you um if you are drawn to uh, that egotism if you uh, if you and i should yeah it means if you mm, find a resort within your egotistical nature and you think uh, if, if that's your thought i won't fight if you think that if you consider that yet because you're absorbed in your ahankari your egotistical state of mind and you think no i know what's best i gave some very learned words to krishna in chapter one and um i've explained why i shouldn't fight i know best yet ahankara masritya cleaving to ahankara not because you necessarily you think reasonably but just it's that emotional sense of pride um not wishing to submit to good instruction or even consider good instruction so yadahankara masritya nayotya iti manyase then krishna says if you still persist with your decision that you, i will not fight nayotya Iti, nayotia, iti manya say. Mitya isha vyavasayas te. Aisha vyavasayas te. This resolution of yours. Vyavasaya means a determination, this conclusion, te, of yours that you might reach. The conclusion being, nayotia, I will not fight. Mitya. Useless, meaningless, invalid. Your prakriti, not here meaning matter in a general sense, but your individual nature, prakritis tvam diyokshasi, will compel you to take action. And this is interesting, and this goes on into the next verse, which we'll have to, verse 60, which we'll have to take up next time. But let's conclude on that point. This final point that Krishna is making to Arjuna is, and he, he says, you may, sitting here or standing here, decide, I won't fight. But ultimately, that resolution you reach will be mitya, will be false, be meaningless, invalid. Why? Prakritis tvam You see, your prakriti, your personal nature, your svabhav, as the phrase used in the next verse, your svabhav, your inner nature, the yokshasi will compel you. It will cause you to engage in action. The point is, and I think this is very practical advice specifically for Arjun, 
Arjun, perhaps unlike Yudhishthira in the Mahabharata, is a Kshatriya through and through. He's the very best of Kshatriyas. Kshatriya dharma, Kshatriya nature can be elevated or degraded. Duryodhana is a degraded Kshatriya. Uh, Arjun is the best of all Kshatriya. He shows the very best of the Kshatriya nature, protecting, uh, doing good to, to, to people. Bhima, a little bit below Arjun, I think. Karna, a little bit further below. But what the point that Krishna is making is your Kshatriya identity is not just a badge you wear. It's not just a birth emblem. It's a part of the nature that you were born with. So... You may go away. No, you won't see. I won't fight. Sitting down there. And then you'll see the battle start. The forces coming forward. Your brothers, your four remaining brothers, put under pressure. Your, 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 your side, your faction, those who are your allies being um, attacked and oppressed by the enemies, the wrongdoers, the, the Kauravs. Then your Kshatriya nature will come to the surface. You won't be able to withstand the pressure of your natural disposition. Prakritist farm the Yorkshire Krishna says, your nature will force you to act. Your, your, your innermost nature, your own personal Prakriti will force you to act because Kshatriya isn't just what you were born the family you were born into, it is a part of your swabhav, a part of your identity in this world. And the fact that you have that kshatriya nature will mean that you won't be able to stand back and simply watch your, your brothers, your friends, your allies being afflicted. You will be overwhelmed by the power of that nature and you will be forced compelled by that nature to enter the fray to protect those who are on the side of righteousness prakritist found the yokshasi and let's just do the next verse i know we're running over time again prakritist found the yokshasi because krishna really expands on that point in verse 60 svabhava jena kauntea nibadaha spena karmana um bound nibadaha yes uh, controlled svena karmana by your own personal type of action svena karmana which is svabhava jena which arises from your inner nature your svabhava the nature the identity the characteristics that you were born with svabhava jena, svabhava jena. so that activity of uh, behaving conducting yourself like a kshatriya is not just something you may or may not do it's a part of your identity and again it's that point each and every one of us apart from our spiritual identity within this world we have a particular character a particular identity which makes us peculiarly inclined I mean, peculiarly, particularly inclined towards a certain mode of living and conduct. And that Svabhava it, it controls a large part of our life. So Krishna says, Svabhava Jaina Kauntea, Nibodha Hasvena Karmana. You are bound, you are inextricably linked by your innermost nature to this particular course of action. Nibadahasvena karmana. Kartam nichasi yanmo heart. That which uh kartam na ichasi, that which you do not wish to do. Ichasi means desire to do. Kartam nichasi yan mo heart because of the illusion, the folly, the delusion that is afflicting you. Moha karis yasya vashopitat. You will be forced to do it. Karishyati, it's a causative future, I think. You will be made to do it. Avashaha. Vasha means power, control. Avashaha means powerlessly. Arjun, Krishna is making the point very clearly now. You haven't even got a choice, Arjun. You may think, Nayotsya, you know, being proud, egotistical, I won't fight. I know better. But it's, you won't be able to because your innermost nature on the battlefield, as the 
war rages and the combatants come forward, then your swabav will come to the fore and you are be compelled, Nibadah, as a result of that, to participate in the war. Your nature, your very nature, your very identity will compel you to act. So that's a bit of a point aside. I think it's specifically aimed at Arjun's position here. He's basically making the point. You are what you are. You are Kshatriya. And when this war comes, you're not going to be able to sit on your chariot just watching what's happening to, to people. Your Kshatriya nature, your Kshatriya identity will force you into the um, into the fray, into the battle. Now, from verse 61, another famous verse, um, which um, uh, Krishna again goes back to Bhakti and the nature of the deity within. I've already mentioned that, but the knowledge, Mat Prasada, comes from the grace of the deity within. In verse 61, Krishna makes that point uh, completely explicit and leads then 61 to 66 to the final conclusion, which again is all about bhakti, which I think again uh, shows us very clearly that um, whatever else it is, the Gita is uh, a bhakti shastra. Uh, it is a, a it is very much about bhakti, about the deity and the blessings of the deity, the grace of the deity. As we've heard twice in these verses we've looked at today, Mat Prasadat, through my grace, Barasamarpana, to borrow Ramanuji's phrase, Krishna taking up the burden uh, of the problem of life from us and, 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 and uh, doing it for us. Anyway, again, sorry, as with last week, I've overrun time, but I did want to get to that point because... 59 and 60 are very closely related so uh hopefully everything being well uh we'll be back next week and we'll push on really with the final substantive section of krishna's teaching again from 67 to 78 the final 12 verses are um concluding words but 66 is the final word of the direct instruction so don't miss it and uh We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening again. Uh, good night. Namaste.